Um, so it was really hard to pick um, specific topics to talk about here today because uh, Web Core Vitals and SEO are two massive topics. So I'm just going to give you like hints about specific things that are very important, um, but you'll have to do a lot of Googling on some of these things. Um, just have 30 minutes for this entire presentation, so I won't have time to go into like a deep dive into some of these things. So let's just uh, start. Okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago. I flew 10,000 kilometers just to be here. Um, I live in Thailand right now. Um, that is my Drupal handle. You might have seen me around the block at some point, and I've been using Drupal for 17 years now. I currently work at Salsa doing all of that. And um, I started a kind of new YouTube channel and my plan is to talk more about this, these specific, specific topics. Um, right now, just one video and like 100 views or something. But it's a new channel, so hopefully it will get going eventually. Okay, so first let me um, explain what are the core web vitals for those of you who don't know what it is. Um, these are metrics that Google measure to determine how user-friendly your site is. Um, once you make your site user-friendly, uh, Google will reward you um, by ranking you higher, given that you have high-quality content, of course. Um, Google specifically states that page performance matters. That is a direct quote from Google. And here I've um, literally copy-pasted some quick stats from this link here um, to show you that some of these companies, the bigger companies at least, that Improve these metrics had great success um, in, in their bottom line and financially. So a website that is user friendly will rank higher than a competitor's website, um, given that everything else is equal, like you have high quality content and so on, right? So if you want that um, competitive edge in terms of search ranking, this is one area that you can improve and uh, I will show you in this presentation how you can improve some of these metrics. So let me just explain what are some of these metrics, right? So the first one is first contentful paint. And the definition is there at the top of the screen, but I'm just going to read the English version here. Um, so this represents the first point in time when the browser paints something to the screen. So in the screenshot here, you can see this is um, a mobile version of the Google search. And the first contentful paint happens on the second one there, which is, that is the first thing that the user actually sees. And this is what this metric actually measures. And at the bottom, you're gonna see like, um, the time that this happens is considered good if it is less than 1.8 seconds. And, you know, in the orange section, um, it means that you need to improve it, obviously. And if you are in the red section, you're doing very bad and you should like, um, definitely try to improve this. The second one is largest contentful paint. Um, now I can do an entire presentation on this. But what this is, is um, it represents the time taken for the main content of the page to be painted. And the page can have different content. Um, which can be considered the LCP, but is the largest one that is actually considered in the end. So if you look at the screenshot here, um, on the second screenshot, on the second image, sorry, the LCP right now is that text block, right? And then the page continues loading until you get to the last one, then the image pops up and then that becomes the LCP. So then Google um, recognizes that the actual LCP here is the, is the image at the end, right? And here at the bottom, you can see um, where you fall and what you need to do if you're depending on good or bad. Um, there are different elements that are considered for LCP. You have image, em image elements, image in S SVG, um, video elements, and the LCP in this case is the poster image in the video element. Um, you have CSS background images and block level like text elements. So ideally, you want your LCP to be a text block, 
This will um, help you achieve the fastest LTP if it was a text block. Obviously, this cannot be the case for every single website because it really depends on your design. If your LCP is an image, you can improve it by preloading it in the, head, in the header and optimizing the image size. So you can use like WebP, AVIF, and responsive image size. The objective here is to make that image as small as possible. Right? Um, in the cases of CSS background images, ideally you want to put those, if you can, put those directly in the HTML and don't use it as a CSS background image. If that is not possible, at least, at least optimize that image and preload it in the header. Um, if your LCB is a text block, um, like for example, in the first, in the second screenshot there, let's assume that was your LCP. Um, you can improve this by, if it does use like a, a custom web font, you can preload the web font in the header. And even better is if you can, you can self-host that, that web font instead of using an a external domain. Better yet, you can just use a default web font. Cumulative layout shift. So, this is a cumulative measure of unexpected shifting of page elements. So if we look at the screenshot there, um, when the page first loads, it loads this text block. And then apparently there's an image that just, because it's so big, it takes a while to load. And then when it loads, it pushes everything down. So when you have things shifting around the place, this is what C CLS measures. Um, the usual suspects for CLS are images without, without um, dimensions. So in this case, if you did not specify a width and a height, this is what will happen. But if you did specify a width and a height, the browser would reserve that space. Um, so the, it will actually start as in the second screenshot there, and then the image will eventually load, and nothing gets shifted at that point. Um, another usual suspect is a font. So for example, in your primary menu, you have a default font. And then when you hover over it, sometimes you have like a bold version of that font. And then the bold version, because the font is slightly bigger, it shifts. So when you hover, you see that menu shifts. I don't know if you noticed that before, but it is something that very small to notice if you have a, uh, like a fast internet connection. Um, but if you did slow your internet connection down, it is very more, uh, much more apparent. Uh, another one is um, third-party ads uh, or widgets um, that dynamically resizes on itself. So if you have like ads on your page, um, if it's not implemented correctly, you know, it could be bigger or smaller and it shifts around the content a lot. And the last one um, is content injected with JavaScript, especially third-party JavaScript. So if you have content in your initial viewport that is loaded from JavaScript, that is going to be a very big factor that will affect your CLS. And here we have the scores, so you know where you, where you need, uh, if, you know, uh, if you're good or needs improvement, and so on. Um, just by the way, there's a link right at the bottom there if you want a deeper dive and understanding of CLS. Okay. So first input delay. Now, uh, this represents the time from when the user first interacts with the page to the time that the browser responds to that interaction. So if you can imagine, like sometimes when you click on a web page and then like nothing really happens for like one or two seconds and then something happens, that is what we're talking about here. Um, so on this image here, if you look at the main thread line, so every browser has a main thread, which this is what the browser uses to do everything, like load the page, parse the HTML, load the JavaScript, execute the JavaScript, render everything, right? Everything happens on this one main thread. And in that yellow block, um, the longest yellow block there, that, let's assume that that is the time when a browser is actually executing some JavaScript on your site. And if a user was to click on something during that time, they will have to wait until that JavaScript has finished executing, and then the browser will respond. 
So I will show you how you can improve this. This is a tricky one to improve, but I will show you how you can improve this. So here are some ways that you can measure these things. Um, Chrome user experience, um, this measures real world data in the field. So this is what your actual users experience using actual devices, right? Um, Google page speed, um, if you were to run your website through Google's page speed, this is more like a simulated environment um, and it will give you like tips on how to improve these things. But you have to keep in mind that this is a simulation. This might not be what your real users are experiencing. So you might see differences um, between the Chrome user experience report and your page speed insights. And you might be like, you know, scratching your head wondering, well, why is it good here, but it's bad there? That is because one is one is actual user's data and one is a simulated environment. And the Google Search Console, um, they also, they will identify groups of low performing pages for you. So for example, if you have like blog articles, um, let's say they use like a one template, right? So Search Console will not identify every single blog article and tell you like this one is bad, that one is bad. It will just group all of them and give you like a group score and say like your blog articles has this group's LCP score of blah, 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 right? Um, uh, another important thing here is Chrome user experience and Google Search Console aggregates data over a 30 day period and that is updated around every 30 days approximately. So it is not real time, in other words. Um, Google does provide a Web Vitals library at that link. Um, that is a, a, a code snippet of how you would use it. Um, you could read more about it at this link at the bottom of the page. Additionally, um, there is supposed to be a YouTube video in the middle here, but um, if you search this video on YouTube, this gives a very good breakdown on how to measure your web core vitals in real time um, and set it up using Google Analytics and BigQuery. So if you really want to go deep into this, I, I recommend check this video out. It's about one hour long, um, but you, you can get a lot of great insight um, by watching this. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to. Ha. All right, so some other important tips. Um, there are other metrics that you can measure, such as interaction to next paint, TTFB, total blocking time, start render time, page weight, and so on. Now I could talk about each one of these separately for a very long time, but uh, I can't right now. But have a Google of these things um, if you want to learn more about how you can improve each one of these things. They are all important. Um, it's, imp it's important also to remember that metrics evolve over time. So what might be apparent or today might not be so apparent like in the years to come. Um, in the beginning, we used to talk about like DOM content loading and, and page load time and so on. But you know, like these things evolve. You want to set um, performance budgets. Um, you can use these tools here to set, set up these things in your pipeline so um, you know that when you have a merge request, it, you will know like how much it will affect these metrics. You, you can set that up by using, I've used um, NPM bundle size to do that. Um, but there are other tools, I haven't actually used all of them, but you can have a Google of these ones and uh, you can figure it out, I'm sure. Um, I really like webpagetest.org um, because this one allows you to run experiments Without, without changing a line of code. So on that site, you, you scan it using that site. And then let's say you want to simulate how your site would perform by preloading all of your JavaScript, for example. It's just a click of a button and it does that for you. And you don't have to go back to your developers and ask them to do this, right? So I really like that one. Um, you wanna measure metrics that are important for your site. Not all metrics will be important for all sites. 
And it can definitely be overwhelming if you, if you start tracking every single thing from the beginning, right? So, you know, start with one metric and work your way up and figure it out before, like, tackling another one. Unless you have, like, a big team, then go for it. So, I can do an entire presentation on everyone here. But um, you want to make sure and take care of all of these things. Um, please research each one of these individually. They're quite big topics on their own. Um, web.dev is a great resource if you want to learn about these stuff. I tend to find very useful tips there. There's also Google Search Central YouTube channel, which also has a lot of great tips. And there's a Google Chrome Developers YouTube channel, which also is a great resource. Um, just by the way, the font size here is not relevant when I, when I created this talk cloud. That is just my um, lack of graphic design skills. But um, each one is equally important, right? Um, there's one here, advanced aggregation. This is a Drupal module, of course. Um, I have a little bit more on that one in, an, in, a, in a slide coming up. All right. So here, um, the next few slides, I will talk about some missed web performance tips that you can just simply implement on your site and just people are just not doing it for some reason. So for example, in the first one there, um, let's say you have an image which is above the fold, but it is low priority. So for example, let's say you have a carousel, right? The very first image in a carousel is the highest priority, of course, because that is what the user will see. But all the other images are not so important. So you don't want to preload all of those images because you're just wasting precious um, browser resources doing all of that when the browser could have used that time doing more important things. So in that case, you can use this new API. It's called Fetch Priority. Um, just by the way, this only works in Chrome as of now. Other browsers will just ignore this attribute. So here we set a fetch priority of low. So we're telling the browser, we're giving the browser a hint, right? We're not actually forcing the browser to do anything at this point. We're just giving a hint to say, load this image, but with very low priority. Because when, when assets are loaded by a browser, it is given a priority. Um, so in the second one, you can see here that you can also use it on your JavaScript if you were to preload your JavaScript files. Fetch priority can take values. Um, I think it's high and low. I don't think there's a medium. I think it's just high and low for now. You can also use it in your script tag and also iframes. So I've just put some examples here of um, different use cases for this. Um, okay, so when you, very, when you hit a web page for the very first time, then you send a server request, right? Then it goes to the server and, you know, it builds the page and then it sends it back to you. That time, that, that gap time, the browser just sits and waits and does absolutely nothing, right? So you can use HTTP 103 early hints to utilize that time. So in that gap time, what you what can happen is if you did put like your CSS in your link headers and an important JavaScript in your link headers, while the browser is just sitting there and waiting, it will start downloading those assets, right? So then when the page, um, when the page starts loading, it already has that stuff preloaded for you. So there's a module called Drupal Server Push, which does this for you. Um, just, just by the way, this pushes all CSS and all JavaScript, which might not be what you want. Um, there's a patch that is on a way that fixes that. Um, Cloudflare, I know for sure, will issue um, HTTP 103 early hints automatically for you if you already have them in your headers. I think maybe other CDN, CDNs will do it for you. I'm not sure. I haven't used all of the CDNs. Um, so this one is the one that I really like and is really easy to implement. Um, this can be done at the CSS layer. So what this will do is, uh, if you can imagine that ping section is a story class, you can set content visibility to auto. So what will happen here, and this works for stuff that is lower down the page. So when, if, when your page loads, 
this is not initially viewable, right? So the browser doesn't actually render this. So this saves on the, on the render time here, right? So if you have very long page content, this is one thing that will help you very much. Um, is input pending will help with your first input delay. So if you look at the first um, row here, if the, brow if the person clicked on something in the middle of that blue line, they will have to wait until the browser finishes whatever task is doing and then respond, right? With this implemented, if you look at the last line, um, so the blue line, the browser is doing something and then the user clicks, the browser pauses what it's doing, responds to the user, to the click or whatever, and then when that is finished, then continues um, executing that JavaScript task. So you can use this to improve your first input delay and interaction to next paint or IMP. So in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the next three slides, but I'm just leaving it here for the recording purposes because this is actually very important and a lot of sites do use CSS background images. So if we do have time, I'll come back to this. That's one, two, slowly, three. Okay, so HTML is very fast. You wanna like put things inside of HTML if you want them to load immediately, right? Um, the last point here, um, JavaScript is the, the fastest way to build a slow website. I'm sorry if there are any JavaScript developers in the audience. But what I mean here is uh, like third-party JavaScript and JavaScript injected into the theme. I'm not talking about like React. And here are some common mistakes um, that people usually make. A lot of people lazy load images, but if you lazy load images that are in the initial viewport, then it has the, the opposite effect, right? So do not lazy load images that are in the initial viewport. Um, there's a little bit CSS snippet there that you can use. If you insert that, you can see right away if you have any images that are, lo that are lazy loaded in your viewport. And if you do see that, um, you need to get rid of that lazy loaded on that image. Um, so I don't have time to go into everyone here, but um, I would like the second to last one, I would like to talk about that one. So a lot of Drupal sites have, um, we use views and filters in your views, right? And I've come across cases where, you know, because sites change hands with different developers many times, over time people add filters to views and these might not be necessary because it's not used anymore. So look at your views and try to clean them up. It will definitely help in improve your page load time. And if your view is using the default CSS and HTML, but you're not actually using that in your theme to style the page, then you can just turn that off. Um, this will reduce the HTML DOM tree. DOM tree. And you, it, it might seem like, okay, I just did all of that work to save one kilobyte, but one kilobyte really does matter. Every kilobyte does matter. All right, so some other important metrics that apart from web core vitals, um, there are other important metrics that you can measure such as, you know, this list here. Um, just one thing about carbon footprint. Um, so monitoring your website's CO2 emissions helps you understand its environmental impact and identify ways to reduce your digital carbon footprint. So I will show you how you can measure these. There are individual tools that you can use to measure each one and I've listed them out here. So you can go to each one, measure them and, and fix them, right? Um, for the last one, Carbon Footprint, we are developing a tool that, that measures that one. And I'll talk more about that in the next slide. So uh, at Salsa Digital, uh, we are developing a Drupal 360 audit tool, um, which will go to all of those tests that I just, those tools, sorry, that I just showed you in the previous slide, aggregate all of those results for you and give you this report at the end, right? So, it, it tracks all of those metrics that I mentioned, gives you one report um, with, with tips on how to improve these metrics also. Um, right now, it's, uh, it's an alpha testing. And here's an example of the 
tips and the do-it-yourself, sorry, the do-it-yourself tips that the report will give you. Um, so it gives you like instructions on how to improve um, your, your speed, SEO, accessibility, and so on. Um, we have an early access uh, of this service. If you come across our booth, you can give it a try. Um, so please come to our booth and let's talk about Drupal 360. We could give it a scan of, a scan of your site, see how it goes. And I, that's about it. Um, I can take some questions or I can go back to the CSS backer images. Here's a, here's a problem with CSS backer images. So you can see in this menu here, I have all of these CSS backer images loaded, right? What happens here is when, if you were to load this website on a slow connection and you hover over one of the menu, these images, there's just gonna be blank spaces and it's gonna populate one by one, right? Which is a very bad experience. So in the first solution, what I did was combine all of those images into a sprite and then I preloaded that that image sprite at the top, give it, and give it a fetch priority of low. Low because it is not immediately needed when, it, when a user loads the page for the first time. When a, when a user goes to the page for the first time, they're more than likely just gonna read the content, right? So the browser's preloads kind of will find this image and preloaded, so when you click on the menu, the images are already there, right? This is an okay solution and it will work, but there's an even better solution which is solution number two. So here I've shifted the, the, the image down nearer to the, the footer, just before the body tag. And I'm not preloading it, I've just put it directly in the HTML and not displaying it and setting fetch priority to low. So what will happen here is the browser will find this image, it will load it with a very low priority. And then when the browser clicks on the menu, the image is already there. So I think this solution is slightly better than the first solution. Um, don't do this if this image is um, very important for the initial viewport. Um, if that is the case, solution one is better. So I think that was it for CSS. Okay, I could take any question. Not from Google Analytics, this is tracked um, when, when users opt in from Chrome, um, Chrome, I don't know how actually they track this, but Chrome gathers this information from real users. So when you, when you go to Google Search Console, that is where that data comes from. Not, but you can set up your own Google Analytics to track this if you take a look at that YouTube video that I have posted. Google Analytics doesn't actually track these metrics by default. Not necessarily. Don't use JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> just ideally, just pure HTML is the fastest, right? But obviously, we don't just use pure HTML. But if you can just use pure HTML, that is the fastest. That's, that is what you should aim for. But it is not always the case. Yeah, if you do use a lot of JavaScript, uh, good luck. <laughs> you might want to preload some of that. Um, you could preload some of that in your header. You can reduce it. So cut the ones, cut the JavaScript that you're not actually using and defer it, right? Um, there are ways like using async and defer. Um, so every, you look at your initial viewport, whatever is important for that first initial viewport, you preload all of that and you push that directly to the user. Everything else could wait and you just defer that. That is probably how you could.